So we're at one pass, so maybe we should get started. So uh, first speaker is Matteo. He's going to yeah. tell us about optical manipulation of Rashba splitting in a two-dimensional electron gas. Yeah, uh, thank you. So thank you all for the opportunity that you gave me to, to present our work. So as the title says, I'm going to talk about Rashba spin orbit coupling and a way to, uh, to control it using ultra-fast uh, optical excitations. Uh, so this work has been done at the University of British Columbia, the, the QMI Institute. Um, and of course, let me acknowledge everybody who worked on this project, all my colleagues in Andrea Damascelli's group, and this is our um, part of our laboratory, uh, with the contribution of David Jones on the optics side. And as well, we have collaborators in Aarhus University in Denmark that provided us with the samples that we use for this experiment. So this data is now recently been published, so feel free to, uh, to go and check it out. So because I'm gonna talk about rush bus spin orbit coupling and I'm going to show a lot of dispersion uh, of, of two dimensional electron gases, uh, I'm gonna start just there. So just, um, which I think it's a good point to start. We're gonna look at the at dispersion. So energy versus momentum for a two dimensional electron gas. Uh, this is a pretty much a free electron state that looks like a parabola in two dimension. Uh, in normally there is no other uh, the this band is spin degenerate. Um, however, when we find ourselves in confining two dimension, like in this case, usually the surface or an interface, then the inversion symmetry is broken. Uh, and if the spin orbit coupling is strong, then the following can happen. This is where the rush by effect really comes into play. Um, so with the rush by effect, the band is split into two sub bands that have opposite spin chirality which means that at plus K and minus K, you're gonna have opposite spin polarization. Now, this doesn't carry any net spin polarization. It's non-magnetic, of course. However, if you check at the band dispersion at the finite K, you will see that there is a splitting in energy between two bands that have opposite spin polarization, which means that uh, in order to carry any spin information, uh, you need to unbalance your Fermi surface. In, um, and this is usually done by, for example, driving current. This is the easiest and best way you can do it. It can also be done optically in other methods. Um, so the, the obvious manifestation of the Rashba effect is a splitting that in the dispersion, you can see both in energy and in momentum. And if you look at the dispersion relation, uh, we are adding a term, let's say in first order, this can become quite more complicated, but in first order, um, it's a term which is linear in momentum and has a proportionality constant, which is this alpha parameter. So uh, this alpha parameter really encodes the strength of the Rashba spin orbit coupling in your system. And to look back at the dispersion and the splittings in energy and K that you see, both of them are proportional to this alpha parameter. So what is inside this alpha parameter? Well, there is the atomic spin orbit coupling, pretty much means that heavier atoms are gonna have a stronger uh, spin orbit coupling as always, but it's also proportional to the electric field, which is perpendicular to your uh, two dimensional electron gas. And this is very important because this gives a way to control the, uh, the rush by effect. Uh, and increase or decrease this, this kind of split. So Rashba effect has been a staple in the, in the solid state field for many decades, of course. It's uh, at the center of, of uh, many manifestations of uh, spin dependent phenomena like spin orbit torque and the spin hole effect, as well as any charge to spin conversion. Um, and more recently in the search for Majorana fermions, this is all related to um, having the, uh, into having Rashba states. And one example that I really like to use um, is the one of the spin transistor when we you try to make an actual device. Now the spin transistor is being quite elusive really, but I just like to, um, to use it as, a, as an example that shows how the Rashba effect is important, how you can, uh, how it important it is to control it. So in, a, in such a device, you will, have a, you will inject into a two-dimensional electron gas, a spin polarized electrons. When you have a Rashba state, the electrons which are spin polarized are going to feel um, an effective magnetic field, which is proportional to the, uh, to these, um, to the splitting in the Rashba two-dimensional electron gas. And which means that the, the spin will start to process until they get to a drain point. 
Now, this means that if we can tune the, the strength of the Rashba parameter, we can actually align or, or not align the, the spin polarization of the incoming electrons and the drain, turning the, this device from a state of high resistance to a state of low resistance, so nominally, nominally like a zero or one state. Um, and this is usually performed, of course, by uh, controlling this electric field, which is perpendicular to the two-dimensional gas. And this is this has been done, although it's actually a pretty uh, difficult device to 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 make. But this has usually been done by using um, electric uh, gating, so static gating. So what we are curious about now is that we know that the Rashba effect is so important and and uh, and ubiquitous as well as in spintronics and fundamental physics. Is there a way that we can manipulate it and we can change it instead of using static gates by using optical excitations? Uh, and this would bridge, of course, the, the field of optics that brings uh, uh, a good uh, energy efficiency as well, as well as um, uh, very fast dynamics and into, into the field of uh, spin uh, dependent phenomena, spintronics. And of course, we're not the first people who think of anything like that. There, um, there is several examples of how you can use ultra-fast optical excitations to, um, to induce a photogalvanic effect in high spin of coupled materials like topological insulators or Rashba states, and which will create a spin polarized currents that can be controlled through the polarization of the incoming light. Um, other examples include, of course, uh, also um, a switching uh, ultra-fast switching of magnetic uh, materials, both ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic, um, which really takes this spintronic uh, field into, into the terahertz regime because of how fast the optical excitation can be performed and the dynamics of the electron in this case. So our idea is a little bit different than using the photogalvanic effect, but rather to use a photovoltaic effect like you will have in a solar cell. So the idea we're trying to understand if we can use uh, ultra fast excitation, optical excitation to control the Rashba spin or big coupling. So the Rashba splitting and how can we, and how can we detect it? So the, the, we are gonna go into detail of how this will work, but the main, uh, the main idea is that when you create uh, electron hole pairs in your, in your material, the, the, the combination of these will, um, will change the electrostatic environment that the two dimensional electron gases will, will feel and, and hopefully also change the, um, the strength of the Rashba splitting. So how do we go about to, uh, to perform this? Uh, we, our instrument of choice is Angorizol photoemission spectroscopy. Um, this is, uh, you have seen, of course, some talks before about this. Uh, this is a photonin and electron out technique, uh, which is, gives you a direct, um, a direct evidence of what is the band structure in, uh, in your material. And you can see how uh, this is quite tempting, uh, of course, to make such an experiment for us because you can look at a, um, at a, a Rashba split state like the following here, and this is experimental data on a gold 101 surface state. And you can see the splitting with your own eyes, which means that quantifying the Rashba spin or coupling strength, it becomes very straightforward. And you don't need to disentangle it from other contribution as you will have in, for example, a transport experiment. So it's a direct spectroscopic evidence of the Rashba spin on coupling. Now, the system that we choose to perform such an experiment is uh, we take the bismuth selenide material. This is a topological insulator. It's not because it's a topological insulator that we choose it, but rather because we know that we can create very uh, nice two dimensional electron gases with Rashba splitting. And you can see the direct evidence over here in this image the linear band, this is a topological state, which we can actually use in our analysis a bit as a, as a control group for what we're looking into the two-dimensional electron gases. And then we create these two-dimensional electron gases uh, by doing chemical, um, chemical gating at the surface. So for the, we have two, uh, two of them, this is because they, uh, they take the form of quantum well states. And the first one uh, has a strong rush per splitting. And the second one is just barely visible below the Fermi level. So there's not many electrons in the one, at least not just yet. In order to see how this system, how the band structure reacts to an optical excitation, we need to introduce this. Um, and so we need to extend RPS technique into the time-resolved uh, domain. 
uh, we do this by uh, utilizing a pump and probe scheme, which means that not only we have a ultraviolet violet, uh, laser, uh, ultra short pulse uh, that can perform the uh, spectroscopy, but also we need to introduce a well synchronized uh, pump um, pulse, which is uh, on the infrared uh, energy range. And this the scheme of the very end of our much more complicated setup is just here where the pump and the probe get, com get combined into, uh, into our vacuum system where we perform the uh, spectroscopy measurement. So um, how uh, we, with this technique, we can actually change the delay between the pump and the probe and pretty much reconstruct the movie of what the, uh, of what the optical excitations does to the system. And this movie is going to appear here. So you can see at time zero, the, uh, the pump takes electrons from below the Fermi level to above the Fermi level, and they slowly decay back down into some sort of equilibrium conditions. So let's look a little bit. We can take some snapshot out of these movies to understand this a little bit better. And so this is the system nominally in equilibrium before any pump excitation. And this is the system uh, uh, just when the pump and the probe are, uh, are overlapped, which means that we have a uh, strongest excitations. Uh, the difference image shows a depletion in electrons uh, below the Fermi level and, and accumulation of electrons above the Fermi level, uh, which you can expect for any uh, optical uh, um, excitation of electrons. Now, after eight picoseconds, the system is relaxed back down. We don't have all these electrons above the Fermi level anymore, but we can see the difference is still quite striking with respect to uh, the equilibrium conditions. So let's now focus on these two images, the one in equilibrium and after eight picoseconds, and try to understand what is going on. To understand what is going on, we're going to use mainly two uh, metrics. And, um, and the first one is we're going to look at the energy minimum of these two two-dimensional electron gases and how these behave over, over time. And you can see already from this image on the left with respect to the right how the, the, uh, the minimum of these uh, two-dimensional electron gases went down quite uh, quite a lot. And this is an indication for, which is pretty straightforward for parabolic bands, they were putting electrons into the two DAGs. So uh, we can look at the behavior of how this happens over time. So from negative delays up to eight picosecond delays, this is the behavior for the quantum well state two, which is this little two-dimensional electron gas here and for the quantum well state one, which is the bigger one. And you can see that the, uh, the behavior, uh, the, tra the time trace is a little bit funky, and we can decompose it into two main uh, components. One that is very short-lived, uh, we attribute this to uh, very hot carrier dynamics. Basically, it means that we are create, we're generating electrons above the Fermi level. This is very, they're very energetic electrons, they're very hot, and they're recombining, and they're changing the screening in the system. The second effect, which we are uh, mostly inter interested in, this is quite long lived, at least uh, up to eight picoseconds and actually much more as we will see later. And this we really attribute to a photovoltage effect. Uh, so the effect of this is to reduce the energy of these quantum well states, which means that we are putting electrons inside the, inside the state. Now, uh, this was the first thing we, we learned, of course, we are putting electrons in the quantum well state and they last for very long. And the second question is what happens to the Rashba effect? And is what we are most inter interested in and what we were looking for. And as I said before, this analysis is kind of uh, easy uh, because we can directly look at the, at the dispersion and look at the splitting between these two branches, uh, both in energy and in momentum. So the curves that I plot here on the right side are, um, uh, are reflective exactly of that. This is the, uh, in purple, we have the a system in equilibrium, and in blue, we have the system after eight picoseconds pico after the excitation. So if we're looking at the splitting, we're really looking at the distance between these two peaks. And the distance it decreased uh, at, in, the, in the blue curve. In, this is decreased both in momentum and is decreased in energy. So we can go back to our uh, to a very simple um, formulas for uh, getting what is the uh, the strength of the spiral decoupling, and we can see that if both these um, splitting are changing, it means that spin the Rashba spiral decoupling strength is effectively reducing uh, due to the uh, due to the pump 
uh, on the on the sample. And we can follow this as a function of time, of course. In, uh, in orange, we have the analysis through the momentum uh, splitting, and in green, the analysis with uh, looking at the energy splitting. We don't really have a good data between zero and two picoseconds, and this is because of the strong thermal broadening that happens uh, uh, after, uh, right after the optical excitation. Uh, but it becomes quite easy after the electrons decay back into a sort of semi-equilibrium, it becomes easier for us to, uh, to feed this data again. And we can see overall, we can plot this as a function of the Rashba parameter itself. And we can see that there is an overall decrease of about 15% uh, from the equilibrium conditions. Now, uh, this is quite uh, this is quite striking and uh, it's quite unique. So we see that uh, on um, on the picosecond time scale, we can decrease the the rush bus spin orbit coupling strength. And the only thing that we're still wondering now at this point is uh, before we get into why this happens is how long does this process uh, last? So how long does it take to go back to equilibrium conditions to what we had before? And to do this, we design a little bit slightly different experiment where the um, where the sample is uh, is gated such that we only uh, we only have one quantum well state, so one two dimensional electron gases, and the second one is not populated. And now we take the same time uh, time trace, and you can see over here what is the time time trace at the at gamma point, um, but over a much longer time scale, so we go up to five hundred picoseconds. And quite strikingly, we see that at, at time zero, as we expect, the quantum well state one uh, lowers in uh, in, uh, in energy, which is a means we which means we're putting electrons into it. But also, the second quantum well state gets fully populated that it wasn't before. And this is the time trace, and you can see even after 500 picosecond, the the second quantum well state is still is still a little bit populated. Now it's pretty straightforward to now fit these, uh, these curves with some um, decaying behavior. And we obtained a, a lifetime of this process of about 950 picoseconds. This means that in order to come back to equilibrium conditions, it takes about, in our case, one nanosecond for the whole system uh, to relax back to, uh, to the initial state. So how does this happen? And uh, in order to answer exactly that question, we talked about photovoltaic effect, but we want to do uh, go a little bit beyond and look at the, um, uh, we make some static and dynamical simulations of what happens in the system. So these are simulations that we made for our own system. Uh, there is a band bending at the surface, which creates our two dimensional electron gases. They are sitting right here. This is the first one and this is the second one. And now there is the introduction of um, optical excitation, which create electron hole pairs. Now, because of the built-in electric field in this region, the electrons are swept to the surface and, uh, um, and the holes are uh, go into towards the bulk. So this has two effects. And this is the, um, so the, the two effects are the following. The, the first one is that we're going, the electrons seem to be very happy to sit on top of the two-dimensional electron gases and increase the charge, which is exactly what we observe. And the second effect is, the, um, is that the separation between these negative and positive charges creates an electric field, which is opposite of the built-in electric field. And this is exactly the photovoltage effect that we're talking about. Um, which means that the, the band bending is softened, but also, but uh, which is symptomatic of the fact that the overall electric field at the surface is reduced, which explain now why the rush of splitting is reduced as well. So we can go a little bit more into uh, the details, so, but without going too much into the details, but just how we do the simulations. We, uh, we calculate the band bending solving the Poisson equation. We calculate the electric fields. We calculate all where all these um, two-dimensional electron gases are and what is the strength of the Rashba spin orbit coupling. And then we introduce free charges and we look for each time step how these charges move in this electrostatic environment. And then at each time step, we're going to feed the results into back into the beginning and recalculate it, recalculate it to get a time trace of um, of uh, of the whole electro uh, electrostatic system uh, electrodynamic system uh, as a function of time, and these calculations. If you are any interested in anything like this or anything similar, where you are doing any um, 
semiconductor physics and you want to calculate band bending, quantum bus states, and things like that, please, uh, we, have a, we have a code. It's a simple code in Python. It's made available. So feel free to go there, download it, and use it. And the, the overall results of, the, of our simulations are shown here in the following. On the right side, we have the experiment and the data that I showed before for both the energy change and the splitting change. And now the results on the simulations are here on the left side. And we can see how uh, the photovoltaic effect is very well reproduced by the simulations. And we can see the energy decrease and how different it is for the two quantum well states and which is symptoms of electrons going on to the quantum well states. Um, and as well as the change in the Rashford spin of coupling uh, that uh, is plotted here and is directly uh, showed the same kind of trend that we see in the experiment. So we're quite confident that the photovoltaic effect is the reason why uh, why we can uh, change the, uh, the, this alpha parameter in the in the Rashford speed. So just to um, uh, just to uh, 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 summarize this and, and maybe put this a little bit in context. Um, so the idea is that our results show that we can use photovoltaic effect now to control. Uh, the rush bus spin orbit coupling uh, itself, and this works on a picosecond time scale. Really, this process appears to be extremely fast in uh, in happening. Uh, we're talking about femtoseconds, but it takes about a nanosecond, at least in the system, uh, to go back to uh, the equilibrium. So this effect, uh, we believe, is really generic for all all two-dimensional electron gases in semiconductors because there is nothing about bismuth selena, the sample that we used, which is specific. This is photovoltaic, this is two-dimensional electron gases. It was just convenient for us to use this, uh, this sample. So we hope this uh, comes with a really helps bridging this, uh, the field of spintronics and, uh, and, uh, as, uh, and the field of optics and in trying to make a switching mechanism for, for spin orbitronic devices. And I always like to think back of the, um, about the uh, spin field effect transistor. And now you can think that this, um, this could be done instead of with a static bias, so with a static gate, you, will, you could use an uh, uh, ultra short um, pulse um, uh, of, of light. And in the, uh, our results are kind of, if you very naively put it into the equations, you can see that the results of reducing the rush bus splitting of about 15% is uh, quite, it becomes relevant in devices of about 100 nanometers or more. So it is kind of like in the ballistic region. Um, so um, uh, before I, I finish my talk, actually, let me do one more thing, which is to uh, do a little bit of advertisement. So all these data that we acquired, these were done in-house where we needed lasers to do this, but we also have um, uh, a beamline at the Canadian light source. And uh, this beamline um, has actually two end stations. And one is the RPS end station that you can see in the scheme over here. Um, and this has been now running for about two years. It's been giving us very good results. As, um, it's actually very well performing. Uh, if you're any interested, you just need to apply or talk to us. And the second one, which is actually coming very soon, is a spin RPS end station. And I like to uh, talk a little bit about this just because uh, this is what we are commissioning right now. You can see in the picture here on the left, the RPSN station is here. And as I said, fully functional. The spin RPS is fully mounted and we are uh, in the process of commissioning. And the idea just to connect to the kind of result that I, uh, I just showed is that um, uh, this system is going to be uh, equipped with also the ability to perform spectroscopy in situ on actual devices. So you can apply gate voltage, you can apply bias, uh, pass current through your sample and so on. So um, we're very excited about this. And if you have any idea of, uh, of the kind of experiment you would like to do in uh, with this, please contact us. We are very, we welcome, uh, and we will welcome users very soon. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you, Matteo, for a very nice talk. Uh, quite, uh, uh, talk is open to questions. So just raise your hand or, or just unmute yourself. So actually, I'll, I'll ask a question first. So um, the 900 picoseconds, 
seems like a pretty long relaxation time. I mean, I have a little bit of experience looking at uh, ultra fast dynamics, and I would think that you know, electron phonon scattering time might be of order, I don't know, maybe 100 picoseconds. Do you, do you have an explanation of why it's an, you know, practically a nanosecond relaxation? Yeah, so at the beginning we were actually puzzled, but uh, then we understood that this was, um, when we understood it was due to photovoltage. So the reason is that there is quite a, um, quite a separation between these charges. So they cannot really recombine because they were swept away. So what happens to relax the system is that uh, there needs to be diffusion from the area around the, where, the, where the laser, where the pump is. Uh, hit the sample. So, and this diffusion is quite slower than uh, than the photovoltage process itself. Uh, so we think that we can probably uh, control it. So is, is, is that just, the size. is that just limited by the, the mobility of the sample or? Yeah, so it's given by by the mobility and yeah, the diffusion rate through through the surrounding area of the sample. So we think that if we change the size of the pump, we might actually be able to uh, to change this relaxation time. I see. Okay, Doug has a question. Thanks. Really neat stuff. Um, this may be a silly question. Uh, so I know, obviously, since you're doing all this time-resolved RPES stuff, the surface quality has to be extremely good because you're doing RPES. But I was wondering how, you know, in your in your cartoon of having a real device, right, where you're imagining, uh, you know, optically manipulating things. I mean, how sensitive do you think this would be to to you know, what you do to the surface, right? I mean, are different surface, I assume different surface terminations would change the band bending. So it's going to change the, the time scale and the dynamics of some of these things. Yeah, so uh, we, by doing spectroscopy, of course, uh, have, things are very different from when you do devices. So I can imagine in a device kind of thing, you will protect your surface by with like an overlayer, like uh, so that your Ashba state will be at an interface rather than the surface. In our case, this we cannot do that because we need access to that surface. Uh, so we do this chemical gating with, uh, with alkali atom on the surface. Uh, and then the process becomes quite complicated because the light really enjoys removing these alkali atoms from the surface. So we need to time our experiment very well. It's much more uh, complicated, but I would really think that it becomes much more usable if you just trap your surface and become like a, an interface rather. Thanks. Okay, we've still got a minute or two. Any further questions? Okay. Well, if not, why don't we uh, get set up for the next speaker? Thank you again, Matteo. Very nice talk. Yeah, thank you.